Okay, let's uh, reconnect to the previous uh, weeks ago a discussion about uh, web applications, and in particular, you remember we discussed the um, CSS style sheets and the Bootstrap framework for uh, or for exploiting a set of a, a huge set of already defined uh, CSS styles, so that we don't have to be crazy with uh, all the definitions. And uh, what I mentioned very quickly at the end of uh, that class uh, uh, was that uh, there is also a more or a simplified way hmm, of using Bootstrap inside the uh, Flask, inside your Flask applications. And there is a package in Python, actually, that will help us simplify a lot the adoption of Bootstrap inside our web applications. So, of course, you don't care if you're building a web server, uh, sorry, a, a REST server, where you only care about uh, serving JSON files. But if you are creating a user interface, uh, you could uh, uh, develop, um, download a new package called the Flask Bootstrap, and uh, that will create uh, for you a default page, a default template that you can extend, and this template already contains uh, all the um, bootstrap uh, classes uh, defined for you and it takes care of downloading the la la latest version of bootstrap and so on okay so and it's actually quite easy to do first of all you must uh, ensure that in your python implementation in your python installation you have this uh, not just flask but also this flask bootstrap uh, extension installed and if you have that in your uh, installation, in your setup, you, you just need to modify the application that you created, the Flask application that you created by extending it. So it's quite a strange uh, syntax. We are uh, used uh, no, to create a Flask application like this. App uh, is a new Flask uh, class uh, with a given name. After that, we can call the bootstrap on the application, the bootstrap function on the application. Bootstrap is a function that is defined inside this Flask bootstrap package. And it seems that we are not doing anything with this statement because it looks like we are creating a bootstrap object and then throwing it away by, from the syntax. Actually, what we are doing is that uh, this call modifies, adds uh, some other methods, some functionality, some property into the application. So we are sort of injecting uh, some new functionality into the application object that we already have. Uh, in this way, um, you, we ca you could extend, uh, is, a, is a common uh, practice in Fla with Flask plugin, plugins, you could ex extend uh, the, your application with different methods by calling say, extension method that modify your app method itself. Uh, so it's a strange syntax. It seems that nothing is happening. Actually, what you are doing is modifying <coughs> the application. And uh, the modified application comes with some additional predefined templates. Actually, it defines uh, a set of templates uh, under a bootstrap namespace and so you can define your own templates and on the on the web application by extending the predefined templates that come with the bootstrap layout so when i'm calling these methods nothing really happens i'm just extending the application object with some new functionalities now i need to learn how to use these functionalities and basically since bootstrap is a front-end framework, all the work to do is into the templates. Uh, and we are using the um, uh, inheritance mechanism that uh, also templates have. So not only objects can inherit from other objects or classes from other classes, also templates uh, can inherit from other class, uh, templates. So we will start our templates by, ex by declaring that our template will extend a more generic one. And the generic one will contain all the boilerplate code, all the template code uh, needed uh, for 
loading bootstrap and so our first uh, um, instruction will be, will be this one and then we'll have to customize uh, this uh, extended page by uh, injecting different uh, blocks uh, inside but maybe it's easier to see that on a, an example hmm? so this is uh, how our pages will look like our template will no longer you don't see any longer the html head uh, title uh, body slash body and so on it's everything about the general structure of, of a web page is extended from the base page what you do is to redefine specific parts specific blocks uh, inside uh, that uh, page and in particular with this uh, with the syntax block and block you are replacing a placeholder in the general template with your own code so for example to set the title of the page you redefine the block title and this content of the block title will go inside the title text of course of the general template for the main body content you redefine the block content and you, you put inside the content of the page and so on so flash booster comes with some predefined uh, block names uh, the ones that are more useful are title possibly styles if you want to add additional side sheets uh, content or navigation bar if you want to have a navigation bar on top of the content and the scripts uh, that will be used to call uh, javascript uh, content that we will see later so actually quite easy uh, i'm uh, using the uh, to-do list manager that uh, was developed in the lab number five okay so you already know this code it's what i just downloaded it from uh, python lab 5 on the website and you already know that this uh, can insert a new task and it's working should be working enter okay i didn't click uh if we put the new task at the beginning because it's uh, an, alph an alphabetical sorting here order it just plain HTML. So the first step we are trying to do is to transform it into Bootstrap for giving a, a decent layout for this application. Okay. So how to do that? In uh, our web application, we only need to import an additional from um, from. Flask bootstrap import the class bootstrap and after we create the application we extend it with the bootstrap method bootstrap up okay so right now we are working with an app that already has the new templates defined if we restart the application nothing changes because right now we are only defined the new capabilities but we are not using them for using them we need to redefine the work in the template redefine the templates so we will delete most of the template code because most of the details are already taken care of by the base class we just have to extend the bootstrap slash base class dot html and then you can delete all the rest and replace them with the with the blocks syntax so this base page is an empty html page with an empty title an empty content and so on so we want to redefine the title to override 
we are actually creating a subclass from a given class. So we are overriding specific parts of that with this block syntax. So one first block with the title, percent block, title, and block, and we copy the title there. And later, we have the content, so we define block content. Block uh, and block. So we don't have all the HTML template code, only the real specific code. So if we have a look at this redesign page, so what did we do? I deleted all the head, bo uh, HTML, head, body, meta, and stuff like that, tags. I replaced them by the extension of the base page, so the empty bootstrap page, and then redefined what they need to change from the base page. If I restart the application, you see that something already changed. For example, the fonts and the styles and the spacing. So it, it already applied the default uh, bootstrap styles. It still doesn't look right because it's all flush left with, uh, with no margin. And because we didn't apply the rule number one for bootstrap, which is everything should be into a container. Uh, remember, in bootstrap, uh, all the content of your page should be inside one big div content is only you should only displace in the in the in the body but then you need uh, to en enclose your code into either a container or a container fluid class in all, in all, in all your pages container is a fixed white container and fluid is adapting uh, to the size of the of the viewport of the of the browser. So the easier one is the container, con and so that everything should be here. So block content means uh, this is the body of my page, and the body contains uh, or the HTML page inside the container that gives the general borders, margins, and so on to the page. So in this case, it's better managed. And we can proceed like this by applying uh, uh, normal bootstrap classes. Now you see that the height of this uh, Text box is different from the height of this button. It doesn't look like, uh, doesn't look nice. <coughs> so we could apply bootstrap uh, classes for the form. Hmm? So I don't know if you remember them by heart, but uh, you can always look at the CSS classes for forms, so for example, here. where you remember to wrap all your um, parts of the form into a form group, every part of the form should be the same form group, or into a form in line if you want them to be in the same line. And uh, in this case, uh, this will be the, the, the shape. So. Do we want uh, a form like this or a form like this with the um, full white uh, text for entering the code? Hmm? So we could have uh, a group uh, here. So this paragraph could be maybe just a div with a class uh, form group. 
clauses uh, here. Not this. Right, not here. Like that. And then another button, which is a default submit button. We modify the button here. So I'm just applying bootstrap classes to make it look li nicer, right? By following the instructions on the bootstrap website. Where is that here? So the button handle is here. Uh, it didn't. Okay, for of course, because I have to add class from control. And this should be a label, so the way of uh, So with it, this just actually the combination of the flash bootstrap extension, where we are getting rid of all the boilerplate HTML code, and uh, a bit of knowledge of the bootstrap classes to transform the layout. We didn't change any bit of functionality. We only changed the layout and the, vi the, the visible aspect of this page, hmm? which looks nicer. And if you have a look at the source code, you see that all the doc type HTML had uh, and so links to the bootstrap code uh, and some scripts at the begin at the end uh, I have been generated for you. So you didn't uh, also those these uh, other you know, uh, tags uh, have been generated automatically. So we don't need to care about them. Okay, so this is the way we are going to um, to work uh, from now on. All the templates uh, will probably be better inherited from the bootstrap base so that, uh, we, that we, have, we have less work to do. Just remember to add the container because otherwise bootstrap will not recognize all the, tasking, all the, all the tags inside. Hmm? This is the most uh, frequent error in bootstrap, forgetting the, the big container. Uh, you may wonder, this is a, is a fixed white container. So if you reduce the size, it will try to maintain the margins and resize the rest. The fluid container will uh, also shift things around because it, the container fluid element here is thought for the mobile devices that may have different size. Hmm? And uh, it will adapt uh, better to, to the size of the page. Okay. But this is easy. We didn't change the behavior of the system. We didn't change uh, uh, anything more. Uh, if, if we think about this kind of interface, the, from the point of view of the user interaction, okay, user interaction is quite limited here, hmm? technically. Technically, what can a user do on a web page? Actually, the user is limited to two different actions, submitting a form or clicking a link. There's no other possibility. Okay, you can write something here, you can scroll, but nothing that concerns the web server. The only way for letting your web application evolve and change is either submitting a form or clicking a link. And we already know that, for example, when the user is trying to enter an empty task, Actually, the browser doesn't know anything about the concept of task or whether it should be empty or not. It just submits it anyway. In fact, when I click the enter here, 
you see that the browser flashes a new page is loaded nothing happens why don't we see any empty task here because the application logic checks uh, whether the description is not empty here but for example if i enter a very short task I should it's a fact is entered normally and uh, i need to delete it uh, later but all the checks all the content all the evolution of the web application happens on the server side in the processing of the request could we improve it for example we are used to application that are dynamic no? if i try to probably the enter button should not be enabled i should not be able to press it for example unless i wrote something with a minimum number of letters or if i try to press it i should get a message please write something longer but this requires some way of processing the user interaction on the browser without going onto the server okay so this is what we are trying to do today today we are trying to see how we can enhance improve we're trying to open a file first how we can improve the interaction on the client side come on it's not so difficult by adding functionality in uh, in javascript okay you did it so we are adding one new language it's not my fault there are so many different languages to be able to handle the user interaction on the client side directly on the browser to give what the kind of dire immediate feedback that we are used on to everyday applications okay which is not possible with HTML HTML gives you fixed pages and the only thing the user can do is click on links and uh, submit form okay we, we want to do more and for doing more we need to use this JavaScript language Sorry. that is an additional layer okay we already have uh, the, the data layer we have the application server the Python flask application we have the presentation layer HTML CSS and, and bootstrap and then we are adding interactivity on the client side you can remember I have this picture that we show some time ago where we have all the technology on the server side hmm, that was used for generating HTML5 so that is what was fla what flask is for querying the database and generating HTML5 with all the templating and bootstrap and to make it nicer and so on. And the HTML file was sent to the browser and the browser was uh, processing the HTML file and displaying it on, on screen. So basically up to now we interacted, we have interacted only with the half of the browser, the layout engine inside your browser. The layout engine reads the HTML file, processes the images, the HTML and the style sheets, and draws the picture, and draws the page, okay? And then it's done. Page processing is only done once. When I receive the HTML, I process the HTML, I load the images, I load the style sheets, I do all the computation, apply the styles, and then the page is done fixed forever 
until the user clicks uh, and a new page is loaded and all the processes started from scratch. Now we are adding a second ingredient. We are discovering that the browser also contains an interpreter for a language that is called JavaScript. So inside your browser, you have a virtual machine, an interpreter for the JavaScript language. Like in your computer, you have Python to interpret Python code. In your browser, you have a, a JavaScript interpreter embedded into the browser, which is able to execute code written in the JavaScript language. And this code is, ex is downloaded again from the web server. So like in the same way, an HTML page can embed a style sheet or can embed an email. And the browser will do an additional HTTP request for getting the image or an additional HTTP request for getting the style sheet. In the same way, an HTML page can contain a JavaScript, a reference to a JavaScript code. And the browser will make an additional HTTP request and get the JavaScript file, which is delivered to the browser. From the server side, JavaScript doesn't exist. It's just a static file, like an image, like a PDF, like a zip file, like a CSS. On the server side, there's no processing at all, nothing related to JavaScript. The server, Flask, doesn't recognize JavaScript at all. It's just a file, static file, in your static folder, right? Because the JavaScript source is being sent to the browser and being uh, interpreted by the JavaScript engine inside the browser. Actually, what happens is that uh, you have some content which is mixed HTML and JavaScript in every web request, and the images and style sheet, of course, we already know that. But now we focus on HTML and JavaScript. And when this mix of, of content, HTML and JavaScript, goes to the browser, the browser splits it into two different pipelines. The layout pipeline that reads the HTML, interprets this, creates internal, an internal representation of the page that is then used to render the page on the user window. This is what we already, we already know except from this DOM block that we'll see in a moment. But we already know that the browser is able to get the HTML, read it, and rendering it onto the user window, onto the browser window. This is just one of the two pipelines. The other pipeline is a JavaScript code, which is extracted from the HTML page and executed by the interpreter, line by line, instruction by instruction. And what can this JavaScript code do? Very little, actually, compared to a generic language. Because, uh, because it's running in a hostile environment. Or actually, the, the code, the JavaScript code, could be hostile. So the browser can trust it, really. Remember what we are doing. A user is visiting any website in the world and just by visiting that website, it gets some executable code that is copied onto my computer, onto the user's computer, and the browser starts executing the code that comes from that strange website. We never go to strange websites, of course, but uh, it might happen. That on our computer, we start executing that code. The perfect virus. Why don't we get uh, hundreds of viruses every, every, viruses every day? Well, because the JavaScript code that is executed by the browser is being executed in a very restricted environment. It cannot read your files. It cannot read your passwords. It cannot delete or, mod or save anything onto your hard disk. Cannot even know which tabs or which pages are open on your browser. It runs into a, they call it a sandbox. 
you know the sand the sandbox concept no? where the small kids go and play with the sand so there is a, a boundary inside the sandbox they can go play with the sand and do whatever they want but they are constrained into that boundary so inside that you can do whatever you want but you cannot go out huh? this is the same that they are doing with the with javascript the javascript code is being executed not on the machine but on a restricted environment that only has access should except for bugs should only have access to two different uh, types of information or objects outside the sandbox one is the user window actually the user window in which the HTML that contained the JavaScript is loaded because you may have more than one user one, more than one browser window every JavaScript code can only access the window in which it was loaded so if I have two tabs open the JavaScript in this page and the JavaScript in this page cannot see each other. The JavaScript loaded on this page, probably there is some, cannot know, it doesn't have the knowledge of which other or whether there are any other pages open in this browser. So this page loaded some code and loaded some uh, JavaScript, and this JavaScript can interact with this page. And this page loaded other JavaScript that can only interact with this page. So every JavaScript is enclosed uh, into the sandbox inside the specific page it was loaded from. So it's a very restrictive environment. But it has nearly full control over the content of that specific page. So it can modify the HTML. It can modify the styles. It can add something, it can uh, uh, intercept the user actions. So when the user types something, the uh, JavaScript can know it, can read the form data and so on. Can do everything with the page. The problem is uh, having a, an easy way for the JavaScript interpreter to understand what is on the page and to be able to modify the page. Because remember, actually, the page is a very long uh, text file. And so if you imagine, okay, I want my JavaScript wants to you know, change the color of the link when I'm moving the mouse over it, which is one possible dynamic behavior. Okay, changing the color of this is a nightmare if you are seeing the web page in this way because it means taking all the page finding the right place and changing the style somewhere i don't know and you, you imagine this page is a long string of text and you need to change the string in the middle in the right point and you can imagine that if anybody changes the page as one line or so your string processing goes crazy so it's not possible it's not uh, humanly possible to manage or to it's technically possible huh? I, I could change from the javascript code i could change the html source but it's not useful it's much better to give uh, to the javascript code the possibility of interacting with the page at a higher level of abstraction and this higher level of abstraction is the this dom block here dom stands for document object model so it's a model it's an abstract model object model made in object-oriented ways, so with many objects uh, and many properties for it for every object, like you have many Python objects, you can may have many Java objects, you will have many JavaScript objects, and these objects uh, represent the different parts of the document. So every tag, 
li, list item, is, will be an object into the DOM. Every link is an object into the DOM. Every div is a, an, an object into the DOM. And every object has some properties and has some children objects too. This, this concept is not new. It's already what we used for thinking about the CSS, okay? With CSS, we had a set of, we call them nodes, and every node contains other nodes, and some rules can apply to some of them, and we can change the properties of some nodes. The same applies here. Actually, it's the same DOM. The same DOM is used both by JavaScript and by CSS. So DOM is a neutral representation of the HTML page that is fully accessible from the JavaScript code. So from the JavaScript code, I can read, query this object model, so read the contents of this object model and modify it. I can modify it by changing the content, by changing the style, so adding or removing some cluster. And by, ma and by managing the events in the page, so what happens when the user does some action. So in this way, we can do any kind of manipulation on the page after it has been loaded and rendered on the, onto the, to the user, onto the user window. Okay? So for now, we have this constrained view of JavaScript. JavaScript is some code that is executed within the context of a page, and it has full control over the content of the page through the DOM objects and can do nothing else outside of that page. Next week, we'll see how we can do something more, but one step at a time. So first of all, how does JavaScript look like? Well, first of all, JavaScript and Java only share one thing, the name, part of the name. So JavaScript has nothing to do with the Java language. And so why is it called like that? Uh, actually, it was a marketing move. JavaScript was invented as a language by Netscape in 1995. Hmm? You probably won't remember that. Netscape was one of the first browsers, was the grandfather of Firefox. And uh, um, they just felt they needed to give some interactivity to web, web pages. And so they made up a, a small language. In the same years, the Sun Microsystem Co Corporation was promoting the Java language. So they were putting a lot of marketing money into the Java brand. And so people from Netscape, which wa that was a small startup at the time, say, okay, why don't we you know, exploit the marketing dollars of Sun Microsystem and call our language something that recalls, reminds me of Java, and they called it JavaScript. End of the story. The, the similarity ends there. Hmm? Actually, JavaScript looks like something that has a C syntax, a C-like syntax, with uh, braces, uh, with for, if, while, variables, and so on, and a Python semantics. Now, if we, know, we know Python, so we know that Python is interpreted one line of the time. It's not compiled like C is. It has dynamic typing. So we have a variable in Python can refer to different types of, of objects uh, at different times. So we don't need to declare you know, uh, the type of the variable like you do in C. And it has a lot of built-in types. In Python, you have the dictionary, you have the set, you have the list. In C, if you want to do a list, you have to fight hard with pointers and so on and create that built-in, that simple type on your own. C doesn't have any built-in type except the array. And it's a stupid array anyway. So it's something that is not so far from Python from the point of view of the how you, con how you program it because it's a dynamic interpreted language. But with a syntax that reminds more of C. So it will, you will feel weird, huh? but... Uh, uh, so how can we add some JavaScript code into our HTML pages? There are two ways. One is uh, 
inserting the JavaScript code directly inside the code with the script tag. So inside your page, you can write open a script tag, slash script, and inside you can type your code inside the page. Or better, write the script into a separate file and call that file from the HTML, like we did with CSS. We put all the CSS instructions into a separate file, and we call that file from the HTML page. So that we have two separate files, the HTML and the CSS. And then, right now, we will have three. The HTML, the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript code. So that we have an, a separate file to edit, to modify, and to, de to debug. Hmm? So actually, we will call the JavaScript directly with a script tag like this. And inside the script, we can write our instructions. Um, in, uh, in our project, an easy way of doing that is uh, to redefine the scripts block. You may remember that I mentioned you, uh, what is that here? That uh, one of the blocks that you can redefine in plus bootstrap is a block called the scripts uh, that contains all the scripts tags at the end of the body. So it, it already has some of them because they are needed for running bootstrap and you can add your own. So you can extend the scripts, uh, sorry, not scripts, block scripts, and block. And inside that, you can call a new script type application JavaScript source the location of the script. So if we set a location for the script, then this JavaScript file will be loaded by the browser when the page is being loaded, of course. And where do we put JavaScript files? Into the static directory of the website. So let's make the static directory. And inside the static directory, we create a JavaScript file, extra.js, extra functionality. And so we can load this file uh, with, the, of course, URL4, URL4 static file name extra.js like any other link like we load an image like we load a CSS file it's a static call and so what happens now if we reload the application, just to check that we didn't make any mistakes, we go on the browser and probably nothing changed. But if we look at the source, which you see at the end, that uh, our um, JavaScript code is being loaded. Actually, I forgot one thing. I forgot to recall uh, sorry, to call the previous block. I need to call a super. In the template, uh, before adding my script, uh, I should call the previous code. I remember that we are redefining some parts of the page. Some parts were empty at the beginning, but the scripts part was, was not empty, so we need to include the previous scripts uh, from the base class, and then we add our own. So super is the method for calling the super class. Hmm? 
the content of the class above uh, our object. And so if we do that, reload the application, yes. Reload here, see the source, and we see that, okay, now we have a previous scripts and our own script. all at the end of the page. Okay, at this point, we have, our browser is loading this JavaScript code, which right now is empty, onto the page. How can we be sure that it's really being loaded? Well, for example, we can write the simplest uh, JavaScript statement, which is alert, I am here, alive. Remember, C like syntax, I want semicolons. Hmm? So if I save this file and I reload the page, you always, uh, in, when you are editing JavaScript and so on, always do shift reload to reload not just the HTML but also all the linked files. And uh, you see what the alert function does in JavaScript, which is opening a pop-up with a message. Mm, it's, a qu it's quite invasive, uh, but it's good for debugging because you can miss it. So at this point, uh, this pop-up was generated by the loading of this page. So what the browser did was loading the HTML. The HTML instructed the browser to load the JavaScript. It was loaded and then it was executed. And executing that, just uh, open the pop-up uh, that I can close, and then right now the JavaScript code is ended. Hmm? So we can write code here, and it will be executed in the content of the page whenever a user loads the page. Now we just have to learn hmm, the language. Uh, and I will just make some quick flashes hmm, just to have a, a big picture of the language and then we'll try to understand the better um, better understand the, the usual patterns in which this language is used hmm? because we are not writing a general application we are enhancing the behavior of a web page but first you know some flashes about the, the language just remember you're trying to blend C and Python. Syntax of C and semantics similar to Python. So uh, if you want uh, a tutorial, we, you can find it at this link. Uh, but as always, uh, like all the web technologies, there are plenty of, uh, of information available. Uh, in, uh, in short, the JavaScript syntax is similar to C or to PHP or in part also to Java, mm -hmm. but Java is very much class-oriented and type-oriented, and so the syntax is very much polluted by the class concept. And in JavaScript, JavaScript is an object-oriented program um, language, but it can also be used without any object-oriented uh, syntax, mm -hmm. just the script language, like, like, like with Python. Inside, they are object-oriented, but you can start using them without, be, uh, without building classes, just by writing code. Um, okay, comments are like in C, double slash and slash asterisk. Variables are identifiers. Variable identifiers are case sensitive, like in C, like in Python, like in all <coughs> modern languages, except for basic, for example, probably. And uh, we declare a variable with var, var, mm -hmm. and variable name, without specifying the type, just the name. This is a bad point because, for example, for declaring a variable, you declare var x. X is a variable. Okay. Uh, and then you can use it. You can assign something to it. What happens if you, and you can use, of course, after the first assignment, uh, you can just use the, the variable name. You just have to declare it once. What happens if you forget the first uh, declaration. 
in Python, you don't need to declare a variable before using that. In C or in Java, if you don't declare a variable, there will be a syntax error. X will be undefined symbol. In Python, there's no problem. The symbol is created the first time you use it. In JavaScript, you won't guess it. If you declare a variable, okay, you are declaring a variable that can be used. If you don't declare it, at the first, so imagine if you don't tell the first line, the first time you, you use the variable, it will be automatically declared as a global variable. You know, global variables are evil. You should never use them. So the effect of forgetting a variable declaration that makes the variable defined locally to the function that you are in, in which you are declaring it, if you forget the declaration, it doesn't create a syntax error. It just creates a global variable. And you can imagine that if you have two different functions with this, uh, where you're using the same variable name and you forget in initializing them, declaring them, you're actually using the same variable without initializing it. Uh, there is no initialization like in Java where every object is automatically initialized. So you are creating problems. This is a, a bad corner of JavaScript. There are a lot of bad corners in JavaScript because of, of historical reasons. Initially, in the very, very first uh, version of the language, all variables were global. Because it, it was thought for very simple script, very simple instruction. Right now, we have applications with our with Gmail is written in two tons of uh, JavaScript code. Uh, so the language has evolved a lot and now is a modern language, but some corners still have the, the, um, the design uh, uh, flows uh, that came from the, for the, from the early for the definition. So remember to declare all the variables if you want to avoid any side effects uh, for the variable being global, global to the page at least. Uh, unfortunately, the compiler, the, the interpreter is very generous, I would say. In, in many cases, uh, it will try to execute the code even if it contains the errors, some errors. Hmm? And uh, you, so it's very difficult to get a, a, an error in JavaScript. And so you can go on with broken code before finding, uh, and very difficult to, to debug. Hmm? Okay, after that, uh, you have this, then we, with this uh, warning, you have the normal uh, dynamic typing that we are used with Python. So the same variable can refer to different types of objects. Every object has its own type, but the variable referring to them doesn't have a, a type uh, by itself. And there are a lot, uh, many more than in Python, a lot of automatic type conversion. So a string is converted to a number or a number to a string uh, as needed. You don't need to convert them explicitly. Hmm? Uh, so it makes it very easy to to do some string processing because you have a string you concatenate with a number and then the rest uh, if it looks like a number can be used as a number uh, for example mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of uh, internal um, reconversion of course uh, the basic types are boolean numbers strings and uh, objects mm -hmm. we have a look at some predefined objects the operators are as in C Mathematical operators, increment operators, assignment operators, string operators, concatenation, like in Python, comparison operators, we have a strange things here, it's only JavaScript that I know of, as a usual double equal sign for comparing the value of two objects, and triple equal sign to prevent type conversion. So usually, for comparing two values, first JavaScript tries to convert them to the same type and then does the conversion. So it compares whether the values are equal. But the types could be different. These are examples. 5 as a number is equal to 5 as a string. Double equal. But 5 as a number is not triple equal to 5 as a string. So if you want, in this case, it does the comparison without doing the type conversion. Here, it first does type conversion, and actually it converts this 5 
into a string and then compare string five with string five and then compare true. So it's um, in some cases this all of uh, automatic conversion can cause some problems like for example here three plus two does it give a five or 32 because plus is arithmetic plus but it's also string concatenation and I already say that strings that look like numbers can be used as numbers and are converted to numbers automatically so which of the two happens I, I don't want to know. Hmm? I want to avoid this kind of, uh, of, uh, of ambiguity. Okay. okay. So let's try always to use explicit variables to store values and so on. So there are some strong corners, as I said, but um, most of the arithmetic is quite predictable. If uh, statements are, are as in C, for Java, by the way, switch is identical to C, case break default cases, for loops, no, I very quick here because actually the, the syntax is identical to the syntax of the C language, with the semicolon, with the braces, and with the round uh, parentheses uh, that, of course, uh, uh, um, Python doesn't want. Break, continue, and so on. So the the basic structure, the basic syntax of the language, we copied from from C. And uh, for functions, the definition of the functions looks much more like Python function, where we just have def function name and the name of the parameters. We don't have any, like in C, the return type of the parameter type, because we don't have type variables. Instead of def, it's called function here. And of course, uh, instead of a, a colon at the end, we have uh, the braces, because we are in the C word of syntaxes, in the curly braces word of syntax. But defining a new function is just giving function keyword, function name, and list of the parameters. Val uh, parameter passing is always by value, like in Python, like in Java. Or you can have a function without any parameter, of course, and you can return a value or return uh, no value from the function. Calling a function is just uh, calling the name of the function. Nothing fancy. Um, JavaScript has, does have objects. Objects are a very light uh, concept in JavaScript. Everything is an object and can have properties. And these properties can be added at any time or removed at any time. Python also has some of this, but the JavaScript is more. Uh, so you can create an object by, just by listing a set of properties. And properties can be values or can be functions. If a property is a function, it can be called as a function, as a method call. And uh, if you are used to Java, for example, where many of the properties need to be accessed with get or set method. Uh, if you have a property called uh, A, you have a get A and set A method for modifying because the property will be private. In JavaScript, there's nothing like that. Uh, you just use object.a and you read it, modify it, change it as you want. Uh, there is no pattern for accessing uh, internal properties. There's no private concept of properties. Property is uh, just something that can be attached to any object uh, of any type. You can al also modify predefined types. Just every identifier, every object has a sort of an internal dictionary that stores all the properties. Actually, it's a, it is a dictionary. It can be accessed as a dictionary. And a set of operations that are no more than value functions. Um, value properties, values as functions, defined as functions. But we don't need uh, usually to define or to create objects or create new classes in JavaScript if you are just programming web pages. We can use uh, predefined objects uh, like, I don't know, the date. there's a date object that can be used to query the date uh, of the system, uh, the string, of course, and uh, for example, string is an object that has a proper a value of the string and the property, which is the length. So length is not a function, like in Python, where it's length, string, 
is a string dot length. And uh, there are a lot of uh, methods for uh, accessing the string, concatenation, finding, uh, finding from the beginning, finding from the end, uh, replacing strings, uh, extracting substrings, and so on. Uh, it's quite powerful string manipulation because actually in a HTML page you need to do a lot of string manipulation. There's also a part of about regular expressions that is also quite powerful in JavaScript. There were at the beginning, in the language, they already defined some uh, methods for putting uh, um, HTML tags uh, around strings. So if you have a string like this, uh, you can call the bold method, and it will add b and slash b tags uh, around the string. This uh, is something that we don't want to use, uh, because it was invented before CSS, where the only, format, the only possible formatting was adding tags. Right now we have CSS and we, what we will do is to change the class uh, of the DOM node that contains the text. Because all the styling, uh, we want to do all the styling with CSS, not with other uh, mechanisms. Okay, I, I don't want to go into the boring details about these functions or these data types because we want to go to uh, some uh, um, actual usage. Uh, okay, the, another data type is the array, which is similar to the Python list uh, in some way. And there are methods for converti converting from arrays to strings and back. Hmm? But we'll keep these slides here as a reference when we need to, to look up something uh, in, uh, in our code. There's also a math object with mathematical constants and mathematical functions. But actually, I wanted to come to this slide, sorry. How do we use uh, JavaScript in a web page in four minutes? Actually, the JavaScript code is used for giving say, dyna dynamic behaviors to a web page. What does it mean uh, having a dynamic behavior? It means that when the user does something, then the page is modified in some way. So if the user does nothing, the page usually will stand uh, still. When the user clicks on a button, writes something in a text box, uh, moves the mouse in some place, then the JavaScript code should react to that specific action in that specific part of the page. So we have to define uh, some JavaScript functions to handle the different uh, things that the user can do on, on our page. And these user actions are modeled as uh, events in HTML. An event is some action that the user does onto a page. For example, I click somewhere, I move the mouse, I type something. All of these are events. Every time you move a mouse by one pixel, the browser will generate one event associated to the HTML element on which the mouse was present in that specific moment. If you click anywhere, you know, here, so here, I'm generating two or three different events. First, for moving the mouse. Second, for hovering over this element. Third, for clicking the mouse. And fourth, for giving the focus to this element. So there's a very long list of uh, HTML events that go and intercept every action that the user can do. What you can do, what we can do as programmers, is to attach to every event that we are interested in, attaching a function to handle that event. So whenever the user does that, that, that the user does some event, I want this JavaScript function to be executed. And then this function can do whatever it wants. It can find you can query the page, find some object in the page, 
and modify their properties, for example. So, if I want to do something when the user clicks into this text area, for example, so imagine you are here, I want to do something, I don't, uh, right now we only can, are able to make alerts, I make an alert when the user clicks here, for example. How can we do that? It's quite easy. First we need to know, what is that? What is the event that we want to handle? In that case, uh, we want to handle the on focus element uh, event. Focusing is means giving the, the focus, the keyboard, onto a specific form. Or it could be a click event. On click. Hmm. Uh, in this case, it's a focus. So we have to modify our, our HTML by saying here in the text area that when the user generates the focus event on focus, call the function focus. So in the HTML, I'm associating a JavaScript function that I have to write with a, a specific event generated on this specific HTML element. So if I click somewhere else, it doesn't call the function. If I click, if I click uh, on this uh, control, it does. So I only need to wrap this function. And this will be called only when the user clicks there. Well, it doesn't work because, because it's 7 o'clock. Uh, okay, we don't have to debug, time to debug it. Huh? This is the concept. Next time we'll see how to do this uh, also with a library that will simplify a lot of the syntax that we have here. Mm -hmm. Thank you.